Welcome everybody to the sec to the second guest of this series, El Maritus Metaphora. This is uh, Patricia Seed, Seed, professor, como el campeador. <laughs> <laughs> professor of history from the University of California, Irvine. Among her publications, uh, she has to love, honor, and obey in colonial Mexico. Uh, ceremony of Professions and American Petimento. Mm -hmm. American Petimento, the pursuit of riches and the invention of the Indians. So thank you very much for being here, Patricia, and welcome. Here, no problem. Uh, do you have my gray bag? <laughs> my talk is in here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I appreciate um, everybody's patience uh, in waiting for me. That's, that's very nice of you. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is actually something that I like a great deal, um, and that is the Portuguese, Portuguese literature, and the Cape of Good Hope. Um, have any of you ever been to the Cape of Good Hope? No. <laughs> I have. <laughs> uh, in fact, I spent a summer there, let's see, at the University of Cape Town. Um, and the University of Cape Town put you up in basically what was an old prison. You can imagine how comfortable that was, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, this is not the best place. I think they'd no longer put visiting scholars up there. Um, but we were just like, you would just go, just, the prison was here, and you go down a hill and then up, and you were actually at, um, you were actually on the southern, you were actually on right near the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and um, it, you were actually in Cape Town where they have Table Mountain. And it's called Table Mountain because it actually looks like a, it lo it's very flat, right? It looks like a tablecloth. You can catch it in all kinds of beautiful light. I, I didn't catch it in any beautiful light. You know, my pictures are terrible. You can actually see. And I know I did not ask Jimena to have a live internet connection, but I actually have pictures of me at the Cape of Good Hope um, and with some of the monuments. And it's actually in my website that's called Latitude. And if, I think if you Google Latitude and Navigation, you get that. Um, uh, it used to be, well, uh, there's a long story behind that, but at any rate, there are my pictures, and you get to see me next to the Padrão of Bartolomeu Diaz, right? And it's like maybe 30 times my height. It is huge. It's absolutely enormous. Um, and it's actually, it's a reconstruction, right? So it's not... The original, they spent a lot of time, a lot of people spent many, many years looking for exactly where he put it, and there was no trace whatsoever. So using some records, this is uh, Eric Axelrod, who's written a lot on that area, um, whom I actually met. I went to his house in Constancia, which is this very nice neighborhood of Cape Town, um, and talked to uh, before he died. This is, this is a long time ago. This is like... Maybe y'all weren't born then. <laughs> it was a long time. He was a very sweet man. He talked about how he'd looked for years and years and finally went back to reading all the Portuguese sources. And when he found in the Portuguese sources was approximately where it was. And since he was the person that had done the most reading and the most research on it, you know, the government of South Africa said, okay, fine, this is where we'll put it. We'll put the padrão right here, and we'll build it in the way that the, the old padrões were made, right? I mean, so it's this massive, it's white, I think it's limestone, um, you know, and just huge, and it was clean as clean could be. And the, the way you could tell me is there, I'm wearing orange, bright orange, <laughs> and so I kind of stand out next to the padrão. But these padrões were put up um, to be, I've always argued, to be put up so that they can be visible from the sea. And the, the thing that I, I love, there's a little story about the padrão of uh, Bartolomeu Diaz, and that is that um, it's, it's way up, and you can see it from far out at sea. Um, in other words, simply because of the height of it, and because it's this bright, bright white, it catches the sunlight very easily, so that even when it's a little bit foggy and stuff like that, the, you can still see this cape. And so you know exactly what latitude you are in the south because you look up and you can see the padrão because the padrão's put down 
at a specific latitude. If you look up and oh yeah, okay, we're this is the right point. You know, now we need to turn turn to the south and to the east. So when they're talking about the Cape of Good Hope as being um, you know, a difficult place to navigate, you know, I, I, I believe them, right? I mean, I've never been in sort of one of the really, really bad storms. Um, and I've sailed in like Auckland Bay in a gale, in gale storm. And, you know, it was nothing <laughs> compared to going off the Cape of Good Hope. So, at any rate. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, I know it has the, I actually gave this talk originally in Portuguese, so I had to translate it into English. Um, Además, que ainda fica no cabo because I, I like the way it sounds in Portuguese, you know, because it seems as though Adamaster, the figure of Adamaster, is still behind that area. It's still, he's still sort of lurking over the Cape um, in kind of a way that, um, that I think that most of us that do Spanish and Portuguese literature don't think of. I mean, we don't think of um, sort of a creature, you know, we think of him in terms of Camões and Portuguese literature and so on, but we don't think of him as something as ha somebody as having had an important impact on the literature of South Africa. And there are a bunch of reasons for this. Um, first of which is that the situation in South Africa, historically, is very different than the situation, say, in India, um, which is where a lot of sort of subaltern studies stuff came from. But in India, the Portuguese were basically replaced by the British and the French, right? But in South Africa, the Portuguese were there. Basically, they had a landing spot. The Cape's pretty nice. I mean, it's, it's actually quite beautiful. Um, and it's a great area for growing crops and all kinds of things like that. So, um, you know, it, they don't really, they don't really settle there. It's basically there's some, they grow some green vegetables and things like that. And they keep the, um, they keep the area basically as a kind of a watering station. But it's not an area that they settled or colonized. So when the Dutch came in with their, and discovered what a wonderful place it was, long story, you know how the Dutch defeated the Portuguese, right? I mean, I don't, that's, do I need to go into that? <laughs> no, okay, all right. So the Dutch ousted the Portuguese from there. Um, and um, took it over, 1652, they planted an almond hedge. That was their founding action. And I had never seen an almond hedge before, but this one was amazing because the, it was all intertwined. It wasn't, you know, like the nice almond trees that you get growing here in California, right? No, it was like a, yeah, right, it's like branches all mingled like this. And it's very, very difficult. If you start to go in, you get sort of pricked and stuff like that. It was in part to keep cattle in and the neighboring people's, the Khoisans people's cattle out. At any rate, this is, so this is viewed as the founding. So the Dutch, as you know, dominated uh, South Africa for about, two, for about 150 years. 1815, the Napoleonic Wars, they take over the Cape Colony. So they kick, kick the Dutch out, and then it's British. So at this point, around 1815, um, the Portuguese are no longer the bad guys. <laughs> the Portuguese have been gone too long, right? And the Dutch um, have, um, in the Cape, oh, not everywhere, you know, they have introduced large-scale slavery. They brought in a lot of slaves from the other parts of the Indian Ocean, Malays, um, people from Southeast Asia. Um, and so they don't have the very good reputation. And of course, it's Afrikaans, which is basically Dutch, but it's very, it's like, it's like kitty Dutch, you know, like there are no verb tenses. It's wonderful. You want to learn a, a language, a, a Germanic language, you can pass easily on a language exam. Pick Afrikaans. First of all, you probably can't find anybody who can give you an exam in it, right? 
so you have to do a self-exam. And uh, no verb tenses, and the words are very, you know, spelt very easily. They're spelt like they sound, you know, unlike Dutch. So at any rate, Afrikaans and the Afrikaners became identified in 1948 with the institution of apartheid, right? So this again reinforces the notion that the Dutch slash Afrikaners are the bad guys. And this means that Portuguese literature, and of which Adam Master is the great story of the Cape of Good Hope, Adam Master can be adopted by people in literature in South Africa in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries as a kind of figure that they can play with. In other words, he's not, he's polyvalent. In other words, he can be used for positive interpretations, he can be used for negative interpretations. In fact, one of the first um, published leaflets uh, against um, apartheid uh, is published in 1951, and it's by somebody who uses the pseudonym of Adam Astor. Um, and he's using Adam Astor as a way of critiquing the current Afrikaner, the then present Afrikaner regime, and the newly instituted policy of apartheid. So uh, um, he becomes, in the hands of some people, he becomes this very um, sort of anti-colonial, anti-oppression figure, and in the hands of other people, he becomes the forerunner of, of oppression and so on and colonialism. So he's, he's a very interesting, he's an interesting figure, but he's a figure that people can play with. And there are a number of South African writers um, that will um, sort of like Kamoyes because he puts a part of South Africa on the map. In other words, he makes the Cape of Good Hope distinctive. He makes it part of the literature. Um, and he calls attention to it um, in a way that people don't forget. Um, and I'm going to go through just a little bit about the story of Adam Astor, read a couple of the verses. And then I'm going to talk about the way in which he's been incorporated um, into, I'm going to read you some of the 19th and 20th century poetry that makes use of Adam Astor in South African literature so that you can actually s listen to concrete examples of what I've just been telling you about, okay? Um, and that's why there are no pictures, I'm sorry. Never mind. I was going to talk about the, the post office tree. Have you heard of that? The post office tree? No? You've heard of Cabral, right? Discovery of America, Brazil. The Portuguese figured out how to go around Africa, right? And it's totally counterintuitive, right? So here's Spain and Portugal up here, and here's Brazil over here, okay? Now, in order to sail around here, what you have to do is you take the canary current, just like Columbus did, and then there are these equatorial bands. And basically, you can take either the north current or the south current, and you have to go all the way this way, because the currents, right, Coriolis effect, right, in the southern hemisphere, the winds and the currents blow counterclockwise, and in the northern hemisphere, they blow clockwise, right? So in order to get this way, right, you can't fight the winds and the currents, right? You can, but it's really an awful lot of work. So da Gama, um, uh, goes like this, and he goes over here, and so he follows the current here, and then goes up around the southern coast of Africa like that. Once they discovered this route, Sooner or later, somebody was going to land up on the coast of Brazil because inevitably they were coming down like this and somebody was going to run into Brazil. April 1st, 1500, Pedro Alves Cabral, who's in charge of the second big expedition to India, gets blown a little bit, of course, and he winds up at 18 degrees south, um, which is on the coast of Brazil. And from there, he sends a ship back to the king of Portugal saying, I've discovered what I think is basically a big island out here, but I'm continuing on to India. So he continues around here, um, 
past the Cape of Good Hope and continues on to India, as he is um, supposed to do. But somebody on board his ship finds a spot uh, where there's a giant silkwood tree. And silkwood trees are enormous. Um, this member of, his, for, of Cabral's expedition leaves a message there for the next voyager who comes through. And the next voyager is actually somebody on a return trip who stops by there and picks it up. And from that time on, it became known as the post office tree. <laughs> and so it became a place where, in fact, it's celebrated in South Africa. In other words, this is part of this way in which they deal ambivalently with the Portuguese heritage because they preserve the post office tree. You know, this is a symbol that post offices have been working in South Africa since, you know, 15, since the latter part of fifth, since 1500, basically. So, and they even have, there's a, even a little mailbox there. You can put a thing in there and they stamp it from the post office tree. That's if you ever want to go there and do that. Um, and then there was no problem whatsoever in Mossel Bay, which actually means Mossel Bay. Mossel Bay is the Dutch. The English couldn't figure that out. So anyway, there they call it Mossel Bay. It's asking Mossel Bay. They put a re replica of Oscar the Gama ship, right? In other words, the South African government, this is a post-apartheid government, put a replica of the Gama ship in there where it, is, it has become a very popular tourist attraction. So it's not as though the Portuguese heritage um, is associated with colonialism, the way we might think of it with, I don't know, Brazil or Goa or, um, I don't know, some other part. Angola, for example. Angola's not, yeah, they weren't very nice in Angola. Um, nor they were in Portuguese Guinea. So there are some places where the Portuguese heritage is a little more mixed, but in South Africa, it's, you know, it's good and bad. This is the section from Canto V, and this is an English translation. Our ships spurred by the fine winds, gallantly the waves plied, when in the hollow of that serene night, a vast cloud suddenly arose, and we, petrified in fright, it glowering above. Black waves pound in ominous sound, as if massifs afar they shatter. In other words, this is that phenomenon I described that, you know, like you're out on the bay and it's a sunny day and everything's calm, and then all of a sudden, boom, these big clouds come in, these huge storms have come up. And then he continues, barely had I wor these words spoke when they from the waves a specter terrific evoked. He was immense, all-encompassing, a wonder of the world, arms and legs as the colossus of roads, fearsome. His rising from the brink, his voice dark, threatful, each eye sink, each with dark glint. His shag hair matted with in slime mold. There's a lot of slimy mold on the coast. Um, his pallid earthly color cold, a vast mouth, black teeth, tarnished tallow, a voice of spine chill sound emanating from the very deepest underground. We quaked in fear, our hair erect at the monster's monstrous invect. And how the master speaks, O oh people, most reckless of all, why? whilst you would storm nature's portal to that retreat where she herself secretes, whilst you would seek out crannies that conceal fates unknown as yet to mortal, for your audacity punishment meet. Listen while I, you tell, disasters that shall befall. Um, and then he goes on to describe how he winds up um, and there's a little bit of um, sort of Portuguese, um, um, hmm. <laughs> I was going to say pride, let's put it that way, um, about the fact that they have discovered this area that nobody else had discovered before, right? Because they're the ones that basically discovered the coasts of Africa and mapped them for the first time. So. Um, he says, I am the mighty cape of storms, immense and mysterious, Ptolemy, Pamplonius, Strabo, and Plinius, of me were ever oblivious. 
It is I who the continent of Africa have piled, set her bounds, and therein my dominion staked, that to the reaches of an the Antarctic's pole are filled, unseen of any mere mortal, until now, now, by your intrepidity, defiled. He continues, talks about how he chased this person, this young uh, nymph that he was in love with and then sort of becomes, goes to grab her and then realize that he's grabbed the mountain, this is Table Mountain. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, and then with dull complain he sank below. The dank clouds dispersed and from afar the sea let sound a high yet higher sonorous moan and then a long, loud bellow. My hands have her words clasped in prayer. I father raised to grasp fast those angels who had sped us there and prayed that we be spared at a master's prophecies. And therein ends the canto quinto. So you have a figure, a huge figure, terrifying figure, some ways, like Shakespeare's Caliban, you don't know exactly what he looks like, you know, because there's so many different ways in which you can portray him. All he's big as the Colossus of Rhodes is the only thing, and he's got these glinting eyes. So the, the pictures, the pictorial representations of him vary all over the place. And it's not quite as varied as, as Caliban in The Tempest, but it's, v it's extremely varied. Um, <coughs> and um, <coughs> the fact that he appears in, and he's adopted into South African poetry, as I said, this and aspects of this canto. And um, not because, you know, there's so many translations of Camões, but rather because the figure is known, perhaps, I, I don't know, I didn't ha have a colleague who's actually who grew up in South Africa, and I, I didn't have a chance to uh, email him. But to ask him sort of whether he had had a master figured in his elementary or secondary education, because there's a obviously there's an awareness of who Adamastor is, but even though there's not a lot of specific translations, in other words, there aren't a lot of good literary translations um, into English um, that are available in um, South Africa, and um, as far as I know, there are no translations in Afrikaans. Um, but there, there might be, since I, I looked for last one. Um, but um, some people, have, you know, some South African critics have said his poem is more in the flamboyant Baroque idiom of propagandistic anti-Muslim romance epics. Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but here, um, I'm going to start reading, this is in 18, this is from 1830, and this is one of the first poems produced in South Africa that commemorates Adam Astor. And this is uh, John Wheatley, I wouldn't say somebody you'd know, writing in the uh, Cape of Good Hope Literary Gazette. Round the stormy cape, bestriding the rude whirlwind as thy steed, the thundercloud, thy car, thy specter shape, gigantic, who upon the gale dost feed and drink the water spout, thy shroud, the skies. As onward sweeps the stormy hurricane, roused like a roaring lion from his sleep, that wildly stares around and shakes his shaggy mane. You can just see Adam Astor's, you know, giant head of curls, going, oh, like that. Um, uh, a few years later, you have uh, William Roger Thompson in Poems, Essays, and Sketches, um, who sees Adam Astor's face on the rocks at the Cape, declares, Bold mariners who sailed of your old saw those do dark rocks, rocks, those giant forms, Cape of Storms, O Land of Storms. I long to see they, they, sto they storm fiend scowl. A little bit of trouble with that <laughs> storm fiend scowl, you know, is making this really terrible um, face. And W. C. Scully has sort of this really very long poem um, about the Cape, and he, he describes the eddying whirl and monstrous shapes, 
the rover saw the tempest garments draped. The guardian of the fabled cape, my demon haunted cliffs, he scanned. Then homeward passed and told wild tales of giant guardians, horrid gales, perils to him who southward sails. But later he becomes Adamaster himself and threatens to bleach the bones of those who dare sail past. When the spoon drifts northward sailing from the wild Antarctic Ocean, when the black southeaster hurls darts of icy smiting hail, I high toss my locks to heaven o'er the storm that wildly whirls. Deep in many a dark chasm's wound, bleach the bones of hapless mortals who my angry cloud frown scorning dared my vapor shrouded portals. Um, you can tell me when you've heard enough poetry. <laughs> I'm going to just keep going because there, there's, um, this is another one. This is from 1887, um, a collection entitled Adam Master or the Titan Shape of the Mighty Cape. Um, and uh, he actually talks about Camões. The youngest Titan Adam Astor named, so sings in sweetest strain the Lucian bard, was banished south to far off country, and here today the giant stands, ill starred, his human semblance altered, and his brow, though princely still, all wild and fiercely scarred. But as of yore he stood, so he stands now and sadly prays to Jove to change his vengeful vow. Um, then we get to the turn of the century, 1906. In all the winds that shiver, we hear some accent speak, and oft at eve when sunbeams leave the wave world deep and dark, or in the mountain passes, we catch through drifting masses the wrath that led the sea kings dead, forever lures us on, the sea kings being had a master. Um, 1909, uh, An Ampler Sky by William Fallow. The spirit of the stormy cape that frowned on Vasco's ship still wears at times that dreadful shape and speaks with threatening lips. Uh, David Livingston, a little better known writer from later on. You will hear them thrashing in like breakers or horses galloping through the bracken, electrically crackling on a thunderous afternoon. And this is where he's describing sort of the um, Adam Master pursuing his nymph. And that's what that's the electric uh, crackling on a thunderous afternoon. And the, the Sar Easters is because those storms, they come up from Antarctica. And so they come up from the southeast um, and had, I mean, that's, you don't see them coming because they come very, very quickly. These storms come up very, very fast. Um, in the Pacific. And they also, this is just to interject a lighter note for a moment, um, they also give us surfing. <laughs> here, here in the coast of Orange County, the surf waves are generated from storms in the Pacific, storms in Antarctica that travel north across Hawaii and come and hit our area of California at just the right angle. So at any rate, that's, yeah. That's just a little side note that that's, that's in fact where, where modern surfing uh, comes from. It's from these storms, but that just materialize suddenly. And that's also why they can tell in advance when they're going to be, when it's going to be good surfing conditions, because they watch the Antarctic storms, right? And then they can see them going across the Pacific, and so they know when they're going to hit at what time. So that's why you can have surfing competitions but you can, you know, a couple of two, three days in advance, you get notice. But in South Africa, it's right near the Antarctic. Um, and so the storms come up and they're boom, they just hit the Cape with all their fury. And they form exceedingly suddenly. Um, at the end of the 19th century, as you know, uh, and it's not till the end, even though the steam engine uh, is invented much earlier and the screw propeller is invented earlier in the 19th century, sort of the battle between sail and steam really doesn't become decided in favor of steam until around the 1870s. <clears throat> and then, even then it takes a while for steamships to be implemented. Now steamships 
are not nearly as dependent on the wind as the sailing ships, so they're much um, less subject to these kinds, of, these kinds of tempests. But nonetheless, the storms, be particularly because of their suddenness and the difficulty in predicting them even now, are still, um, still pose a threat for the unwary traveler. Um, in one of uh, Robert Livingston's poems, Adam Astor becomes linked with the great mountains in Table Bay rather than to the winds and storms at sea. And this is, of course, post-steamship. A pleated apron of wrinkled sand, nursed by two wide, hard-resting forearms, flung out at the smoke-screening surf. Alone, alone, he sleeps there fitfully. A coolie cropped, haired, and orange lichen swims over these iron-muscled rock veins. Down here was hoisted to the tangy winds a naked reel and first momentous love. As he sleeps, he drives with sad, shaking, shuddering, hopeless thuds, these great worm knotted fists into the sea. Da Gama wakes him. Who goes there, seafaring fool? Who disturbs me at my slumber? Who are you? Speak. What year is this? Some call me Luis de Comoish and some Vasco da Gama. I am adventurer, civil servant, soldier, sailor, and poet, and also a ghost from the past, the present, the future. Your cape of storms has at last been conquered. And this is the first time in South African literature that you get a sense that the cape no longer poses such a threat. And it's, it's, it's because of steam, which he doesn't mention, right? But it's the idea that, you know, it's like with the lions, I mean, because there are these iron-filled rocks that are outcropping sort of right near Table Mountain, and incidentally right at the base of sort of the, what is the, as you're facing out towards the ocean, the left hand by is one of the best fish and chip shops in South Africa, by the way. Um, if that is if you're, if you're going there. So anyway, because the fish is just pulled right up from the sea. Um, and so it, there are these rocks, and you can actually, if you've been there, you can see, you know, Table Mountain here, and then the rocks sort of jutting out like this, and they're iron rocks, so of course they're orange in color. Similar, uh, this image of Adam Astor is sort of more grounded, appears in Mary Boyd's 1926 Table Mountain. She describes Adam Astor as the mighty watcher of our southern seas. The rain grooved wrinkles in your yellow stone. The storm had chiseled out your countenance with ravages of a savage jove. Um, and then there's a um, monologue of a deaf man uh, in which he becomes, you know, simply a sea mark, a monolith of volcanic origin. Um, then there's a 1976 poem that I like, um, of somebody returning to Africa after a 20-year exile. This is in Africa after 20 years or nearly, Luanda, new to me, Luanda, Angola. Villas gardening resembling from the air Lisboa, that city of the voyagers, from which our kind of Africa began. There bulbous on Alto da Santa Cristina, Santa Catarina, an image of imagined Adamaster. So Adamaster is, you know, evoked with, you know, sort of like he's the, the one of the memories that he keeps in his mind of having lived in South Africa. Um, so it's, it's a literary one. Let's see. Um, yeah, and then there, are, of course, there are references to uh, Camões as and uh, Adam Master as imperialism's flunky, abusive, time dishonored, one-legged beggin. Um, uh, right, and then the cursed one. Maputo, you don't need that one. Uh, an old titan moaning older threats from under mustaches of combers. Um, uh, this, uh, you know, sort of, so this is, uh, I'm skipping through sort of the more negative renderings of um, Adam Astor, which appear um, roughly in that period between 1930 and about 1950. But then uh, in 1993, one of South Africa's best named uh, authors, Andre Brink, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but um, he wrote a, a um, history of the arrival of the Portuguese 
as the first life of Adam Astor. But um, Brink, of course, does that um, Garcia uh, Marquez thing where he inverts, you know, Columbus and the Autumn of the Patriarch, the famous scene where he takes Columbus's words, you know, I gave these people trinkets, um, and, but he puts them in the mouth of the Indians. You know, who are these people with these big hairy faces, right, because the Indians don't grow much facial hair. These big hairy creatures who seem to be satisfied with feathers and other things that we consider totally worthless, right, where he inverts it. Well, this is what Andre Brink does in Adam Master. So the really smart ones are the Khoisan people who represent um, the heroic people. Um, and um, they're the ones that, you know, create Adam Master. So it's a very uh, different kind of arrival. He also has a, um, introduces gender into this story. It's, it's a long story. Um, Okay, um, and um, see, today's uh, Adam Master's eponymous presence flits across the South African landscape in the form of two separate indigenous butterflies, both named Adam Master. Bink, Brink may be right in having named the big chief, the bird who never comes to rest. African Adam Master butterflies are an evanescent but not forgotten presence. The end. <laughs>